with good news for anxious Christians, uh, that was fairly easy. I just hung around with anxious Christians um, and uh, shared in some of their anxieties and thought, wait a minute, what's going wrong here? I got to figure this out. I, um, I'm a philosophy professor. I'm supposed to figure stuff out. So what's making us so anxious? Uh, something's going wrong. Um, it's something theological. It's something that's going wrong with how we're teaching the faith. So what is it? And and why is it making me anxious? And why is it making my students and my friends anxious? And uh, how can we do things differently? So that was really easy to, to come up with the ideas. It was saying them well and figuring, figuring out what was ailing us that was the problem. The gospel is not a technique or a how-to, right? It's not something that you, uh, kind of a button that you push once in your life and then you're saved. The gospel is the story about who Jesus Christ is. Hello everyone, welcome to The Disciple Dilemma. I'm Dennis Allen. How is Christianity shaping our society? A more interesting question for us today is, how is the contemporary culture shaping Christianity? So our conversation today is to anxious Christians. And it's based on a book written by Professor Phil Carey. It's called Good News for Anxious Christians. That's just one of Phil's many books. And we'll get a download on a lot more of the activity and the things that he's up to later. But I just want you to hear a little bit about this uh, wonderful guest that we have with us today. Dr. Carey's scholar in residence at the Templeton Honors College, which is at Eastern University. That's in St. David, Pennsylvania. If you dig around on his rap sheet that he's got out on the internet, you'll see him describe himself as a philosopher married to a midwife. So he claims that he thinks about the mysteries of life and that his wife actually puts her hands on him. I thought that was pretty good. The Careys have uh, three children uh, and they have grandchildren also, two, three sons, two grandchildren. Did I get that right, Phil? That's right. His undergraduate work is both in English literature and philosophy at Washington University, that's in St. Louis, and his graduate degrees, both his master's and his PhD in philosophy are from Yale University. Dr. Carey is the editor-in-chief uh, of Pro Ecclesia, and uh, his CV is one of those that you just sort of step back and your eyes begin to water. Uh, he's got editorships. Uh, being the editor-in-chief at Proclesia also, board roles, advisory council seats. If I counted this right, Phil, I think there are nine books on the street and three in the works. Is that, is that about right? That's about right. If you count the ones that I've co-authored and co-edited, yes. <laughs> There's 130 papers and articles out there in periodicals and journals that Phil has produced. And There's even four video teaching series. Phil, welcome to The Disciple Dilemma. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. And our co-host is the guy who makes sense out of my nonsense, Dr. Raymond Monroe, who I love, even though he went to Auburn University. I still love him. Raymond, so glad you're with us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Looking forward to the call. Phil's an old friend. Phil, would you um, kind of give us a sense of the trajectory of the work that you're writing in right now before I would deep dive into good news for anxious Christians? What do you think about and how do you come up with all these ideas? Oh, well, with good news for anxious Christians, uh, that was fairly easy. I just hung around with anxious Christians um, <laughs> and uh, shared in some of their anxieties and thought, wait a minute, what's going wrong here? I got to figure this out, right? Um, I'm a philosophy professor. I'm supposed to figure stuff out. So what's making us so anxious? Uh, something's going wrong. Um, it's something theological. It's something that's going wrong with how we're teaching the faith. So what is it? And and why is it making me anxious? And why is it making my students and my friends anxious? And uh, how can we do things differently? So that was really easy to, to come up with the ideas. It was saying them well and figuring figuring out what was ailing us that was the problem. How How deeply does this penetrate faculties? You know, I can see this being written to a bunch of 20-somethings who are sitting around biting their nails in the class with Professor Carey lecturing, but come on, Phil, this can't really be something that's tormenting folks in the faculty, right? Oh, uh, it, it's, you know, I hear it mostly from my students, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's part of the, uh, it's part of a kind of pervasive piety of a certain sector of American evangelicalism, and uh, yeah, it, it's grown-ups, it's kids, it's everybody, um, because it's, a kind of preaching and teaching that's taken for granted 
by pretty much everyone. It's in it's, it's in every, it's in everybody's bloodstream, and uh, yeah, it, it affects everyone who's who who sort of soaks it in. Is this is this like a conspiracy? You know, like there's a bunch of folks in a smoke filled room and they kind of <laughs> clean this up to to build up some power or are uh, we living with just yeah. the avalanche of christianity yeah right it's 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 not a conspiracy there's no need for paranoia it's it, it's taking place right in front of us it's i think it's a kind of culture that's tied to american consumerism so it makes a lot of sense for us in our consumeristic lives to think like consumers um we're, we're kind of doing a kind of spiritual marketing right there's a spiritual marketing uh spiritual marketplace and christians and pastors are competing in that spiritual marketplace so, and so, so we're looking for techniques that will uh help us compete and a, a large way that the techniques work is by making people anxious so that you know we've got them hooked if, if you make these people anxious then they'll keep coming back to get your solution to the anxiety that you've helped give them. And this is not intentional. Um, uh, you know, have you ever had the experience of telling somebody something you've been thinking about and uh, it's in church and, and they say, oh, I see you're, you're, you're having questions. I'll pray for you, right? Now I'm a philosophy professor. So, so my life is a lot about questions. We ask questions ever since Socrates. And to think, oh, you're asking questions. Well, I'll pray for you. That's saying they're thinking, oh, obviously there's something wrong with you, right? I, I'm a nice person. I mean to help you. I'm a good Christian, and and I'll help. I'll try to help you with that. But that creates a certain kind of social pressure. It creates certain kind of uh, group dynamics, and it and that group dynamics grows and gets a hold of people, um, people with the best intentions. Uh, that group dynamics is very powerful, and you ask, well. What's wrong with me that you know that, that I'm not um, finding God's will for my life or hearing God speak in my heart or doing all these things that everybody else seems to be doing, right? And they're praying for me because it's not happening to me. And, and that generates all that social pressure and that anxiety. So, so Phil, you touched on this um, in that last section, but, but I think it'd be helpful for the people who tune in what do you mean by what are they anxious about? Are they anxious right. about trying to figure out God's will for their life? And and um, why don't they just read the, the scripture? What is it that <laughs> makes them anxious? And and how do how, what's your solution for their anxiety? <laughs> right. I mean, one of the things about anxiety is um, anxiety comes from the way you live, the way you think and where your heart is. So each religious tradition really has a different set of anxieties. Catholics have a different set of anxieties than evangelicals. So this is pretty much a set of evangelical anxieties. Uh, it's generated by the things that, that the kind of group dynamics in your particular group. So for instance, uh, evangelicals get worried about finding God's will for your life. Now, if, if you know, Protestants 200 years ago, if you ask what's God's will for your life, they they'd recite the Ten Commandments or something, right? Um, now, the Ten Commandments are something that you used to memorize, but I think probably among my students, uh, not 10% not of them really have memorized the Ten Commandments. Hmm. So they're trying to find God's will for their lives, but they don't know the Bible. They don't know God's commandments, but they're supposed to somehow um, listen to the voices in their heart, which will somehow tell them what God's will for their life is if they can figure out which voice in their heart is really God. Um, so they're looking inside themselves to find God rather than looking in, in the word of God, rather than looking in scripture, rather than learning from what the Holy Spirit has, us, has to teach us in the word of God. And that, that makes you really anxious, right? How do I know which of the voices in my heart is really God, right? It turns out it's kind of good news that the voices in your heart are your own, right? And you're responsible for them and you are not God. So you don't have to have this terrible burden of figuring out what part of you is really God talking. Um, so the, the book is really a, a series of 10 practical things you don't have to do is the subtitle. <laughs> and the first four chapters are these techniques that evangelicals are being taught about how to live a transformed Christian life by finding God's will for your life, listening to God's voice in your heart, um, and letting God take control of your life. That's the other one. Um, and if you don't know how to use those techniques, 
then you're going to be anxious because you're going to think, oh, what's wrong with me? How come I'm not doing what everybody else in the room is doing? Um, and I think that anxiety is a way of instilling a kind of consumer guilt where um, if your life is not going the way it's supposed to, like a, you know, an abundant life and all that, then you figure there's something wrong with your Christian life. You better keep on going to church and figure out how to apply this stuff to your life and really make a difference. Um, and that's not good news. Uh, good news is about what Jesus Christ has done for us and for our salvation, not what we do to transform ourselves, and especially not how we dig around in our own hearts as if the place to find God is in our hearts rather than in God's word. Folks, you're listening to Professor Phil Carey, who's an author and the scholar in residence at the Templeton Honors College at Eastern University in Pennsylvania, talking about his book, Good News for Anxious Christians. Let's talk more with Professor Carey now about what does it really mean when we talk about being an anxious Christian. So, Dennis, Dennis, you've got uh, six, seven things that you think leaders need to change that are hacks in terms of our disciple making. How does what you wrote overlap with that anxiety? Which one of those sort of viral things really overlap with Phil's concern about anxious Christians? And, and you were looking at some of his stuff. Um, how would you articulate your understanding within the Phil Carey universe of anxious Christians. Folks, if you don't know what's going on, I've just been pinned by two PhDs to the wall and I'm about to try to stumble <laughs> through this. So uh, I, I would say, first of all, with Phil's book, Good News for Anxious Christians, I, I love his statement, don't look for the smoke-filled room, just watch how sort of the um, entrance, the infection, the infestation of culture is beginning to drive consumerism into the heart, mind, and soul of the Christian. I would, I would humbly try to tee up um, in the Disciple Dilemma, Phil, we have one chapter that we talk about catch and release Christianity, and it was a story mm -hmm. of Simeon, the stylite elder, who fifth century sat up on this post, folks, for those of you who don't know, and he preached to the Bedouins, and he was the Billy Graham of his day, and uh, Theodoret, who was one of the bishops who was sort of being the biographer of this whole process, watched and said, wow, they're coming. They're getting saved. This is an amazing thing. And about a week later, we can't see any difference, and they've gone back to doing exactly what they used to do. I, I would sort of tee up that we have a Christianity that talks about, come on in, get to be a member, pick up a Bible. We hope life goes well for you. You are now an orphan drop along the roadside. And the only thing you really do get is you get a vitamin once a week, maybe the sermon, right? The one hour a week or 1.5 hours a week of sermons that give you what I think are in best intentions, and Phil talked about this a lot, you know, we're trying really hard to help you guys live a better life, be a better person, be a better Christian. So the joke would be, hey, Phil, practically, what do I do about this? <laughs> There's a joke in there, folks. What do we do? Right. I mean, it, what we do is not the important thing, thank God, right? The really important thing is what God has done in Jesus Christ. Yeah. And that's the gospel. And that's what we need to keep on hearing day after day, week after week, uh, day in and day out. And that is over, over the long haul, that's what's going to change us, is hearing what God has done. But then we also have the commandments. There are things that we do, uh, loving our neighbor. And that means the work of love. And the work of love is hard work. Um, and it can be anything from uh, doing your vocation, right? If you are a plumber, you know, fixing the toilet, that's part of the, the, your, your vocation as a Christian who, who does good work for, on behalf of your neighbor, right? Or raising your children, right? a work of love. And it's hard work. But when you hear the good news that, that Jesus Christ has done the real work of salvation, then that frees you to stop trying to you know, prove that you're a good Christian or something, right? Because that's all about you. And spend your time and your energy on the good work that God has given you to do, uh, 
uh, on, on your neighbor and your children and your, your citizenship. Um, you can free your attention to do the work of love instead of constantly trying to show, oh yeah, I'm a good Christian. Look, I'm, I'm doing all the stuff that I'm supposed to be doing. Um, well, it's not about you after all. And it's very freeing to realize that it's not about you. Phil, one of the things that you really had an influence on, on me that was really profound is to realize life is, a not, uh, is not sanctification, meaning a journey to try and achieve some level of moral perfection to be like Jesus. But life is about showing the love of Christ to my neighbor with all the skills and talents and resources God has given me. And I remain a sinner. So I come and I confess my sin and I get forgiveness. But my moral perfection is found in Christ, not in me. And my role is in every community I'm in is to show the love of Christ to others through self-sacrifice and selflessness. How do we miss that so that we give people a get out of hell free card and just ask them to come sing a few hymns? Ah, um, well, part of it is what we think the gospel is doing, right? Um, mm. The gospel is not a technique or a how-to, right? It's not something that you, uh, kind of a button that you push once in your life, and then you're saved. The gospel is the story about who Jesus Christ is, and that contains the promise of Christ, that he gives himself to us in his word. Uh, in, in baptism and in, in the sacrament of, of the Eucharist. Um, for those of you who are Lutherans, you'll, you'll know what I mean. If, if, you're, if you're not part of that part of the Protestant world, this may take some getting used to. But the idea is that the gospel is a way that God gives us his own son. And um, that's something we need to keep receiving all the time. We need to keep turning to our Lord, sometimes in repentance very often in repentance, as a matter of fact, because we are, we're, we're in process. We're, we're, we are on the pro in the process of being reshaped in the image of Christ, but we're far from perfect that way. And so we have to keep on turning to Christ. And when we do that, we receive the one who is transforming us and making us new. Um, and we learn that this is our beloved. We learn that our beloved gives himself to us so that we may be a different kind of person, namely a Christian, a, a son or a daughter of God, and Christians live differently. Um, and that then becomes central to our lives. But it's also terribly important that when we start living the Christian life, the Christian life is not about becoming a good Christian because that's about self-justification, right? The Christian life is about your neighbor and your children and your fellow citizens and what can be done to make the whole world better. What can be done for the common good? What can be done in my vocation, whether I'm a plumber or a pastor or a politician, uh, to do what is good for my neighbor and will lead them to the, the life in God. All of that is, is a, is, what becomes possible when we see that, that Christ himself is given to us in the gospel. But we got to keep seeing that all the time. What eliminates anxiety is the good news. And the good news is something we need to keep hearing. It's not just, oh, the gospel is here's how you get saved. Now that's over. Now you have to do something to, to prove that you're really a Christian. That, that tends to be disastrous, I think. So the... Uh... The question that's on my mind is, I wonder how much pushback you've gotten from the community as you've written this book. I wonder who's walked up and said, come on, Professor Kerry, sanctification has got to have some kind of place and role in my life. And are you giving me this just sit back and, you know, God will dump this on you thinking. Give us, give us a little sense of what kind of blowback you have received, if any. Oh, well, this is interesting. Um, um... The Lutherans like it and they get it because it's so much of this law gospel distinction thing. Mm -hmm. uh, other evangelicals often don't get it because they want something to do to transform themselves. <laughs> um, and it's, it's a little frustrating to many of them to find that the transformation is not something they do. It's something Christ does through his word and spirit. 
Um, that doesn't mean we have nothing to do. We have all sorts of good work to do. Um, but it's, it's hmm. and in fact, it's not just sort of letting God work in your life. You've got real work to do. Um, and it's, it's your work that you have to do. Um, but the work that really matters has been done by Jesus Christ. And I think the hard thing is to get people to pay attention to what's outside of their own experience. Um, because Christian experience is not about Christian experience. It's about Christ, the beloved. Just like love is not about the experience of love. It's about the people you love. And so much of the work here is to unbend ourselves so that we're paying attention to the people we should be loving rather than monitoring ourselves and seeing whether we're a good enough Christian. Uh, there's a certain kind of preaching that basically turns you back on yourself and you're constantly seeing, oh, am, you know, am I really living the abundant Christian life? Well, maybe not as much as I should. If, if that leads you to repentance, that's fine. If it leads you to thinking, oh, if I would only um, pay more attention to my spiritual life, uh, pay more attention to me, 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 then there's a problem. And, and there's a, right. So I think a good many evangelicals have the notion that the kind of sermon they're supposed to be hearing is really all about me. It's really about my spiritual life, my transformation, how Christ gets into my life and so on, rather than about Christ and how I find myself in him. And so I think the hard part for many evangelicals especially is to see how our, how our attention is directed, directed away from ourselves toward Christ, towards our neighbors, rather than constantly looking at myself and seeing if my Christian life is what it should be. My Christian life is most of the time not what it should be, I sin. Um, but meanwhile, I should be doing my best <laughs> with the help of the gospel to turn my attention away from my life uh, and, and towards others. Uh, and when I do pay attention to my life, it's usually uh, the thing I should do is be repenting. Folks, you're listening to Professor Phil Carey, author and scholar in residence at the Templeton Honors College in Eastern University in Pennsylvania. Professor Carey is talking to us about his book, Good News for Anxious Christians, and we're having a conversation now about how leaders impact that anxiousness. How do we, as leaders, transform our current congregation so they're raising their children as disciples instead of as autonomous, self-authenticating individuals who are going to choose a religion, and I hope they become Christian? Uh, well, yeah. Um, a whole lot of this is going to depend on congregations and pastors who are relearning the gospel by engaging more and more deeply in the scriptural story about who God is and who his son is and who the Holy Spirit is. Um, and a whole lot of the power of that is going to be in the beauty of it. Um, it, it matters that our hymns are beautiful. It matters that our worship is beautiful because that is what will draw people in, um, as opposed to the attempt to be relevant, which tends to be boring, I think. Um, it's the beauty of the gospel and the beauty of the beloved that, that turns us um, uh, inside out and draws us onward. So what, what we need for our children is a, a worship life in the church that draws them into the beauty of God. What matters here is what you think of baptism, right? If you ask someone like Martin Luther, you know, are you a Christian? He says, yes, I'm, I'm baptized. Because for Luther, your, your Christian life begins with your baptism. For other Christians, the, the thought is your Christian life begins when you first make a decision for Christ. The problem with that from a Lutheran perspective is that we make decisions for Christ and then we make decisions against Christ. It's called sin. Right? And none of, our, none of our decisions are reliable enough to save us. It's God's decision that's reliable enough to save us. You know, John Calvin got that. Um, but Luther got the point that 
God makes his decision known to us by making a promise, and that promise is given to us most concretely in baptism. So instead of it all being about what I decide and how I make Christ part of my life, what happens in baptism is that Christ makes me part of his life. And I catch up to that by learning the gospel, by learning to sing, uh, the, to sing the gospel, to hear the, the right kind of preaching, to, to be drawn into the beauty of the life of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in whose name I was baptized. And here's the crucial difference. Um, if you think of baptism as the beginning of the Christian life, then what you'll do when you, after you baptize your children is you'll teach them the Christian faith. You won't treat them as pagans that have to be converted. Whereas there's a, a long stream of evangelicalism where you have to do what's called child evangelism with your own children. You're supposed to basically think of them as pagans until they've decided not to be pagans. Um, and that can cause enormous anxiety. Um, I, I have a, a friend who, who, who says she, she would, was terrified that she hadn't yet accepted Christ fully into her heart. And, and she was, well, what could reassure her that she had done enough to really accept Christ? Now, in that kind of terror, what someone like Luther would say is, remember that you're baptized. And when you were baptized, Jesus Christ claimed you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hang on to that promise and believe it. Now, when you do that, that changes you. And it changes you over and over and over again as you keep turning to your baptism, turning to the word of God and hanging on to Christ. Whereas the anxiety um, was terrifying to my friend. And I think it's, it's, well, in my view, that's not the way to raise children, right? Raise them as Christians. You know, as soon as they're old enough to, un to understand your words, tell them, you're a Christian, here's what you believe. It's called catechesis or catechism, right? You teach them the catechism, here's what Christians believe. Now, when they're old enough, they can re reject the faith. They, you're not taking away their free will. You know, they can go ahead and, and abandon the faith if they want to in their old, in their, when they're older. You, you can't stop that from happening. Um, but at least you can give them the assurance from the time they're, they're children, uh, from the time that they can, from, from, from before, before they can remember, they've always known that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, I belong to Christ. Uh, and that's, that should be the, the sort of the, the basis of their life from the very beginning. Raise them Christian, don't think that they're pagan until they decide otherwise. That's, the, I think, the, the, the crucial um, distinction there. If I really believe the gospel is true, I'm not going to teach it to my children as an option they can have, right. but the right. nature of reality itself. Dedicating children is fine, but um, you need to teach them that they belong to Jesus, right? And that that, and that, that comes first. Their decision for Jesus comes second. First, first, Jesus took you as his own. And he baptized you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit through the word of a pastor and some water. And, and when you have that, then you know that you belong to Christ. And, and that, that's the way to grow up uh, as a Christian. Um, the other thing makes it all dependent on your choice. One of the things with Warren's book and the Purpose Driven Life and all that stuff is that we've lost the sense that my fundamental identity is being a Christian and my purpose in life is to serve Christ not to do something else. And so we really have sort of lost that main point that my identity is in Christ. And I thought your uh, explanation of Luther's quest for certainty is really profound because the challenge we face today is people don't know what they need to believe and they think they need to find some way of being certain that they're saved. As you pointed out about the problem of reform people wanting to make sure they were one of the elect. And to me, the challenge is um, that the solution Luther gives that you articulate so well is if God promised me this, then I can be sure that that's true. So in baptism, when I'm a Lutheran and I, when I teach it in Lutheran stuff, when I'm a Lutheran and I say I'm baptized, when somebody asks me if I'm a Christian, I'm really saying that Jesus claimed me for his own and gave me his promise and that I can be yeah, certain of right. that. I may change my mind. I may have different emotions, but when I was baptized, Jesus gave me a promise, and that's sure. It's it, what it means is that you're putting faith in God's word, not putting faith in your own faith, because your own faith is not reliable enough. 
and your own decision for Christ is not reliable enough, but the word of God is reliable enough. Um, and and that's, that's what Luther wants us to do. Uh, and I think he, his theology sort of zeroes in on that more successfully than any other theologian I know of. Can this thesis be uh, deeply embedded in the lives of Christians from the pulpit? How do we disseminate this best into the lives of the individual believer? Right, right. Um, it really is a matter of, of preaching the gospel, which means, um, think of it as, as, as a center and a circumference. The circumference of the gospel is the story of Jesus Christ with a larger circumference, which is the story of God's dealings with Israel. And at the center of it all is the promise. It's, it's, it's our Lord Jesus saying things like, uh, lo, I will be with you even to the end of the, of the world, or this is my body, it's given for you. That promise is God giving us his own son. What happens in good preaching is that the Holy Spirit uses a pastor to give us his own son over and over and over again. Uh, this is what also happens in a good liturgy as well. Uh, I think what ends up happening is that this becomes, well, it becomes food. Um, a pastor, as you know, is a shepherd, right? That's, that's what the, the word pastor really means. And, and the, the job of the shepherd is to feed the sheep. And what the shepherd feeds the sheep with is this good, kind word of the gospel, which does address us in our anxiety, in our need, in our grief, uh, when we are, when we've lost someone we love, when we're anxious about the success of our children or their, their danger, right? All of us who've ever had teenagers, we know how anxious we can get for our teenagers when they do stupid things like we did when we were teenagers. <laughs> but it's just one of, of a zillion different anxieties that the gospel addresses and says, this is your savior, this is your beloved um, he is giving himself to you so that you may give yourself to your neighbors in love. All shall be well because he has promised. But meanwhile, you're going to have a lot of work to do. Um, but you don't have to have the, the anxiety of thinking it's up to me to transform myself. Uh, we can trust that the Holy Spirit is at work through the word transforming us. And meanwhile, we, we get back to work and, and, and care for our children and care for our fellow citizens and care for our neighbors. I'd like to get Phil to tell us a little bit about what he's working on. What's the latest book out? And what are the next couple coming out? Let's get a little publicity out on that, too, as we talk about this book. Well, well, thank you. Uh, yes. So we've been talking about this uh, book, uh, Good News for Anxious Christians, which um, was published about 10 years ago now. And there's a second edition coming out. So oh. so. So that's got a new um, a, a, a new um, epilogue dealing with you know man, ten years have passed what have, what's what has changed right um, consumer society is being better at manipulating us than ever you know uh, social media is more powerful than it was ten years ago and so on you have an so international version of this too right uh, an international version they're out in Korea. it's in Korea now and oh um, Finland. It, I think. It, there was a Korean translation and a Finnish translation. I don't know why, but th there was. Um, so that was 10 years ago. Then um, Ray has been reading this book called The Meaning of Protestant Theology, Luther, Augustine, and the Gospel that Gives Us Christ. Right? The, the subtitle is, is really what all tells you, right? The Gospel that Gives Us Christ. Right? That, that's what Luther gets, I think. And I wanted to sort of convey that uh, in the book. Uh, that came out uh, three years ago now, four years ago, before the pandemic. Uh, the next book is going to be um, a little introduction to the Nicene Creed. Uh, it's coming out in October called the Nicene Creed, an introduction. So, uh, you know, an, an attempt to teach with the Nicene Creed, who is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which is what the Nicene Creed is all about. Um, and that, I hope that helps, uh, you know, pastors who, uh, in, in liturgical settings, right, right, along comes Trinity Sunday. And the pastor says, oh, I don't know how to explain how God is three and one, da, 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 right? So I'll change the subject and do something else. But if you know the Nicene Creed and, and know the basics of what the creed is teaching, then you can actually teach the doctrine of the Trinity, which is the doctrine about who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that would be nice for Christians to know, right? Christians want to know who their God is. And the Nicene Creed is about that. So 
I, that was another thing that I was teaching to my students um, who often didn't know much about God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, which Christians really ought to know, right? And then um, the thing that, that I'm working on now is, is called Gospel Ethics. Um, an editor over at Lexham Press is trying to get me to, to say more about how you move from hearing the gospel of Christ to living the Christian life. Um, and I'm right in the middle of, of talking about uh, Abraham. And, and you remember how, how Paul quotes that bit, Abraham believed God and, and God counted it to him as righteousness. Well, what is the righteousness of Abraham, the righteousness of faith? And what does Abraham look like as a model for the Christian life? So I'm, I'm in the middle of wrestling with that. Um, and that's wonderful. The great privilege of being someone who writes books is that you get to engage the book, right? You, you, you spend all that time with scripture and that's, that's really good for me. Um, and I hope it ends up being good for everybody else who, who reads the stuff. Well, first of all, Phil, as always, it's a delight to have a conversation with you. Really engaging, really enjoyed it. I'm going to already preempt Dennis and um, see if we could in six months from now get you back on and look at other things. I mean, this is really engaging. And I think you, you make a really compelling case for some of the more ne neglected and yet most fundamental things. Dennis's core uh, idea from his business turnaround experience is the failure of leadership today is a failure to understand the central mission of making disciples. How would you articulate the central mission of the church and how we are either failing or need to change in order to really accomplish what it is that Christ commands us to do in the Great Commission? Yeah. Uh, gee, I, I may end up um, uh, repeating myself. The, the, the fundamental task is to preach the gospel. And the gospel, again, is not um a technique for getting people saved it's the word of god used by the holy spirit to give us the son of god in person jesus christ and that is something that we should be receiving over and over and over again the way we the way we eat right it's food and we need to keep on being nourished by the gospel that will also mean in a kind of as you widen the circumference here It'll be learning more and more about the Christian tradition, about the great teachers of the faith, learn something about Luther, or learn something about Calvin. Calvin was actually pretty good on most stuff, I think, right? Learn something about Thomas Aquinas or, or, or St. Augustine, um, and let them teach you how to read scripture. Learn how to read scripture in a more deep way. Learn how to read scripture, oh, huh, I, I'm, been re listening to J.S. Bach, uh, you know, Johann Sebastian Bach has, has set um, the passion uh, narrative to music. That's a way of learning who Christ is, um, but it also is, is deeply beautiful, right? And it shapes your heart. Um, all this learning is, is what makes us disciples because as you, as you may know, the, the Greek word for disciple in, um, in, in the New Testament is the word for learning. A disciple has a master, a teacher, right? A master teacher. Um, the disciple is a learner who is constantly growing in the knowledge that the teacher has to give him. But the teacher is also the beloved in this case, right? So, so Christ is both our bridegroom and our teacher. And to grow as a learner, as a disciple, is to grow in the love of Christ. But that means also to become more and more like Christ and thus be more and more of a blessing to our neighbors. Um, that's what I think we need to be doing, um, which is to say, we need to be doing the same thing that the church has always been doing. We just have a different set of challenges in our particular time, right? There's always different ways that the church goes wrong. We have our particular consumeristic ways of going wrong, but the task is the same that it's always been. Give people Jesus Christ in the gospel. We're, we're grateful for your time today with us. And uh, folks, if you want to uh, learn more about the book, of course, you'll see the briefs on Amazon and the reviews that are out there. But speaking personally, having read it, uh, it's going to force you to think. And uh, for a lot of us who like recipe Christianity, it's just going to tear up the recipe and make you step back and <laughs> behold the wonder of Christ. So thank you, Phil, for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure.
Raymond, thanks for making sense out of all the stuff I don't do well, but I'm so <laughs> grateful to have you here. Oh, great fun. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Okay. Folks, help us in the uh, digital marketplace, since we're going to switch this back around and go to Phil's thesis about consumerism. We need help getting leverage in the digital marketplace also. Um, I'm sort of a neophyte in the social media arena, but one of the things that we realize is we want to get the word out. The discipleship's been hacked. We want to take a look at the biblical version of discipleship that Christ gave us and how things like consumerism that we heard Professor Kerry talk about today have infested the DNA of the believers walking around in the church today. And you can help us with that, not only by grabbing books like Professor Kerry's work, but also out on Facebook and uh, website, uh, Instagram, YouTube, we've got a place called The Disciple Dilemma. And you can see conversations about this, blogs about this. In fact, Dr. Monroe is actually publishing a blog next week, which will be early August, uh, about Christians are just wrong. And you can take up all of your gripes with him as we look at this problem of the disciple dilemma. And as always, folks, thanks for listening. Thank you.